Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, it's nice for me to have this opportunity to step back into the role of uh, director, uh, even though I'm on leave now and based at the whole center, especially for the duty, a very pleasant duty, of introducing our speaker today, Andriy Kartashov, who I'm pleased to consider a friend not just a colleague. And it, we have been really fortunate recently in that uh, KU has been attracting outstanding young scholars who were able to come here to the university through a Fulbright program. And in particular, more recently in film and media studies. Uh, last semester, one of our presenters in our brown bag uh, was uh, another Fulbrighter uh, in film and media studies, Yulia Glushneva, who spoke uh, about Khrustalov Mashinu, uh, Khrustalov My Car, a very important film about the final days of Stalin's uh, rule, uh, probably the most influential and creative representation of that. Uh, that have emerged in uh, Russian cinema. And today we are thrilled to welcome another uh, Fulbright graduate student in film and media studies, Andrei Kartashov. And uh, Andrei is a graduate of St. Petersburg State University in uh, Russian language and literature. And uh, despite his I think at least, you know, in comparison to yours truly, still very young years, he has been a very successful and accomplished film critic. Moreover, he is now one of the editors of uh, Science, uh, one of Russia's most influential uh, film journals. And he has been continuing his contributions just uh, shortly before coming here. I went on Sianz's website, and among his latest contributions is a piece that, in fact, I read a little earlier, and that is Andrei's reflections on the films Moonlight and Manchester by the Sea, introducing them to the Russian audience. So I'm glad that he is keeping uh, his feet both in the American educational system and in global film criticism and film scholarship, and uh, in a uh, bringing those insights to the Russian public. And today, he uh, will tell us about one of the arguably most interesting and unusual films uh, to come out of uh, Russia in recent years. Um, it's a film that could be considered dystopia, maybe or maybe not. We know that now we have uh, a whole wave of films and TV series that are dealing with that. Um, think of the remake of The Handmaid's Tale, uh, or The uh, Man in the High Castle, and a lot of other works like that that are attracting audiences' attention. So here's, uh, we're going to find out more on the Russian take of trends like this. So without further ado, Andrei, you're welcome. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, yeah, before I start, I think I should mention that this presentation is based off of, uh, of an article that I wrote for MUBI, uh, which is an American website, uh, a streaming service come uh, criticism portal, and uh, yeah, if you know it, if you don't know it, you should check it out. It's, so it's um, MUBI. It's yeah, it's MUBI. M -U -B -I, yeah, has a great selection of international and American art house films. Unfortunately, Target is no longer there because they only keep films for available for streaming for for a month. But it's constantly updated, so it's pretty good selection. And we are going to talk about Target uh, today, which is a film by Alexander Zildovic. Uh, came out in 2011. 
uh, which was not very didn't have didn't have a great success when it was released internationally or domestically. Uh, it's it spent a few years in production in what is known in Hollywood jargon as production hell. Uh, so it was conceived in 2005 and went to production in 2007 and spent four years in production, which is longer than it usually takes to make a film. Uh, the, the premiere was at the Berlin Film Festival in February 2011. So. It was not a great success, uh, probably because my theory is that films that fall into this category rarely do. And by this category, I mean a certain, uh, a certain, not necessarily genre, but a certain, well, category of films uh, globally. Uh, works of the likes of David Cronenberg, for instance, Maps to the Stars and Cosmopolis. Uh, I will return to Cosmopolis a little bit later. A uh, film by Olivier Assayas, such as Demon Lover or Personal Shopper, which is going to theatrical release sometime soon, I believe. Uh, Bertrand Benelo or Jia Zhangke. A uh, Chinese filmmaker who did uh, recently made a film called uh, Mountains May Depart, uh, probably the most successful of all of those I mentioned. So these films are pretty diverse and in great many ways are dissimilar from each other, but they have one thing in common. And that thing is uh, that they, their ambition is to make a film about modernity, uh, to put what we may call postmodern condition after Lyotard, put it on screen. And in case of all of those filmmakers that I mentioned, that means uh, that their aesthetics are grounded in categories like coldness, emptiness, detachment perhaps, sterility perhaps, which leads to, I believe, that audiences do not connect too well to those films because there is nothing much to connect to really. Uh, there is no emotion. It's uh, deliber deliberately devoid of emotion. Uh, so this is the international poster of Target and you can tell there are no people in it, right? And I, I like it better than the Russian poster, which I don't have in this PowerPoint, but it has a bunch of main characters standing in front of the camera and it doesn't convey very well the mood of that film. Um, so the story. Target is set in Russia of the near future. And it's, now it's very near. It's, uh, the year is 2020. Uh, the film was made like six years ago, as I said. Uh, so in this particular setting, Russia is a very affluent country, thanks to oil revenues, natural resources revenues, and uh, tolls from the highway that connects Guangzhou and Paris, which one of the characters call a blood vessel of the continent. Uh, and the political system has evolved in what is known in the film as ecological democracy, which means that it's basically an institutionalized form of inequality in which every citizen occupies their own ecological niche for the greater good of the society as a whole, as they believe. Um, in apparently, uh, apparently the per capita income is growing as it did in the 2000s and it serves as a 
pacifier for population that is ready to trade their political freedoms, their political rights for economic stability. Um, and the main characters, here they are. That's actually the still that's on a Russian poster. Uh, so the main characters are the country's elite. So we have a statesman who is a minister of, national, uh, of natural resources. So he's in this particular society, is one of the most important people in the country. Uh, he's standing in the right. Um, and we also have a paramilitary customs officer. Uh, so he is one of the Siloviki, as we call it in Russia. Uh, and that's the term that unites uh, the military, uh, the law enforcement, and so forth. Uh, and uh, the wife of the statesman, a trophy wife, so he, she doesn't really, she doesn't have any work, so she just confined in her luxurious apartment. And a TV host whose name is Mita. Uh, there are five characters here, as you can see, because they are later joined by a uh, teacher of Chinese who is the only person not from their milieu. Uh, so, yeah, as an aside, the TV host, we can't really see his face in this picture because he's looking down. Uh, he is played by the hugest Russian star, Danila Kozlovsky, uh, who is like the major movie guy uh, right there. And he usually makes films like these two. As you can tell by the posters, those two are pretty terrible because they are. And these are the highest grossing Russian films of the last year. Um, yeah. Uh, so what they do, uh, they travel to the target, which you can see on the picture. Uh, the astro abandoned astrophysical complex somewhere in Siberia that is rumored to possess mystical powers, give eternal youth and give happiness. Uh, it is somewhat vague what the original purpose of the target was, but one of the characters says that it, uh, it is located in the most transparent place on Earth and uh, it receives cosmic energy. You can see the uh, beams of light coming uh, right at it. So this is probably supposed to be cosmic energy, but it's, it's not made uh, clear because Target is not really a sci-fi picture. It doesn't elaborate on any of the technical details or any of, any of the technology that is featured in the film. Um, so to give some idea about how it looks like, I want to show you the trailer international trailer of the film. It's not very good uh, because it makes the film looks, look more, more dramatic than it is. Because as usual, they cut all the interesting pieces together. But uh, just to make, just to have some idea of, of the visuals. <coughs> Yes. 
Зойку все сама увидишь. Но люди оттуда возвращаются, как заново родившиеся. Перестоит стареть. Это излучение опасно? Скажите, вам сколько лет? 52 года. Это надвигается как волна. Волна? Волна и раздает нас щепа. Okay, so like I said, it's not that fast, and it's actually pretty long, two and a half hours, no less. Uh, but the trailer has some of the more, more interesting images that we'll return to a bit later. Um, so let's talk about some of the themes. Uh, from what I told you about the setting, you may have thought that it looks awfully like Russia in the 2000s, if you have an idea of what it was like in the 2000s. And that's because it does. Uh, so uh, the director, Zeldovich, only makes films once a decade. It's largely coincidental, though, because, as I said before, Target uh, was delayed in production. But it's kind of fitting uh, because uh, his previous film, Moscow, released in uh, 2000, was <coughs> it sort of summarized the 1990s in Russia. And Target, although set in the future, summarizes the uh, 2000s. Uh, so it's some sort of a projection of Putin's Russia of the previous decade into the future. And that brings us to another major creative force behind the film. And uh, this gentleman right here, uh, you, as you may know, is Vladimir Sorokin, uh, who is one of the major Russian fiction writers working today. And he co-wrote the script with uh, Zeldovich. Uh, so, uh, yes, Sorokin has been around since 1980s, and his earlier work tended to be more of a sat satire of the Soviet society, which may have been which may have approximated realis realism, uh, but you know, in the form of a decon deconstructed novel, as in The Cure or 30th Marina's 30th Love. I'm not sure if it's translated into English. Uh, or uh, they could be a really decentralized. Uh, devoid of one narrative uh, works such as The Norm, which is his debut. Uh, the Norm was uh, 
In terms of method, it, it was also a deconstruction of the classical novel. It, uh, it featured very bizarrely grotesque uh, plot elements, and I mean like John Waters' grotesque. And uh, it also features a famous chapter uh, in which normal Russian text is uh, decomposes uh, as the chapter progresses to from normal text to schizophagia to just pure gibberish. His later work though, and I'm talking about works such as Day of the Aprichnik uh, or Sugar Kremlin or Telluria, which is his latest, not yet translated to English, I believe. His later works are somewhat more moderate in terms of form and uh, Usually they are dystopias about future Russia and sometimes future Europe. Uh, he doesn't really go beyond that. Uh, and uh, they are very bizarre in terms of narrative as well. So for instance, in Telluria, uh, Europe and Russia is in the new Dark Ages and uh, uh, we see modern technology present alongside with crusaders and werewolves and giants. In Day of the Aprishnik, Russia is, uh, tries to revive the time of Five and the Terrible, and there is a Tsar in the Kremlin, and there are the Aprishniki. And it also erects a giant wall to isolate it from its neighbors. So that's far off, right? Yeah, east or west neighbors? Uh, I think all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, Target uh, tends to be more on the side of Sorokin's later novels. Um, yeah, it's actually a common joke among Russian intelligentsia right now that we live in a Sorokin novel because he predicted all of that is happening. Uh, because Day of the Apparition came way before Crimea, before the Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Renaissance and all that scary things that you may read on the news. Um, Right, so Target was written before, actually, uh, as I said, it dates back to mid 2000s. So it was written before Day of the Aparishnik. And uh, it refers to earlier Putin era. And it has some characteristic elements for Sorokin. And some of them are quite bizarre, such as this sequence, which was featured in the trailer. And this is, uh, in this scene, uh, the custom service uh, literally hunts illegal immigrants. Um, and it's uh, set to a music that somewhat resembles Wagner, so it's some kind of a reference to Apocalypse Now. Um, in general, though, the film depicts a very stable society and uh, I would argue that it's happening after the end of history when nothing changes. Not necessarily in Fukuyama's sense because it's not liberal democracy. Uh, uh, because Russia seems, uh, Russia of the target seems to have made another civilizational choice. Uh, it's heavily influenced by China, so all the educated people, such as the main characters, most of them speak Chinese, and uh, the interiors are somewhat Chinese. They have bamboo curtains inside of exposed brick, uh, which is kind of in vogue in Russia right now. Uh, and you can see Chinese billboards in Moscow, panorama shots of Moscow, all of that. 
Uh, and the Western rationalism was displaced by an odd blend of Taoist philosophy and uh, Eastern Christian spiritualism, uh, as well as uh, hints of Soviet folklore are added to this odd mix. Uh, because the target is an abandoned Soviet complex, as I said, and it's a, it could fit into a, some kind of Soviet urban folklore narrative. Uh, was it, it was an important theme in uh, urban folklore, the, the scientists doing some weird stuff somewhere out there, like Zone 51, basically. Um, America and uh, Western Europe are hardly ever mentioned in this, which leads me to believe that the uh, world order is bipolar uh, again. And uh, I like to think that uh, that maybe the world of Target is the same, actually the same universe as the world of Cosmopolis, uh, set in basically the same time period. I'm not sure if it's ever mentioned what year it is in Cosmopolis, but it's kind of fun to think that uh, these two universes are simultaneous. And as, uh, for instance, as uh, uh, Mita hosts his weird night show uh, in Moscow, uh, Eric Parker of Cosmopolis makes his way through New York at the same time. Uh, and uh, it's important to remember that Cosmopolis is adapted from Sorokin's American counterpart, basically, Don, De Don DeLillo. Um, which brings me to the next part. Uh, I would argue that both Cosmopolis and Target could be described in terms from T.S. Eliot's famous piece. Uh, in particular, the quote, shape without form, shade without color. And the characters could be described as the definition in the title. Uh, because the film Target doesn't focus as much on Target itself. We don't really know a lot about it from the film. It focuses more on the characters. The second half of the film, even more than a half, is, is an aftermath of their visit to this complex. Uh, because the power of, of the Target is not only in giving eternal youth, also, but it also seems to unleash their hidden wild desires, or even grant them. Uh, which is in a discordance with, uh, with the blankness that surrounds the characters. So, so passions, high passions arise, and uh, if anything, they just resonate with emptiness uh, that fills the film. Uh, a few words on how this effect is achieved. Uh, Target has a remarkable set design. As you can see, it's dominated by white spaces, by white color. White color is actually pretty typical for uh, films set in the future. Uh, has a moderate amount of CGI, not nothing very spectacular though except for the target. And it's framed for the most part in long shots that, leaves, that leave a lot of empty space around the characters. Uh, also, often the sets are very wide, such as this shopping arcade that we saw in the trailer. It's a scene near the end of the movie. Or yeah, one of my favorite images in the film is this one, which we also could see in the trailer. So we have a wide open space and 
a car passing through a gateway that comes as if from a painting by Magritte, right? So a door that is not surrounded by any wall or fence. Uh, the target itself sits in the middle of nowhere because in extreme wide shots we can see that it has nothing at all around it, just many, many miles of, of uninhabited terrain. Uh, its precise location is never revealed, but uh, it is apparently somewhere close to Russia's very heartland in West Siberia. Uh, which means that in its core Russia, at least Russia of the 2020, is empty. Uh, on every level of the film, it is this uh, sense of emptiness is sustained by uh, respective techniques. For instance, music is uh, deliberately discordant and kind of unsettling. The film scored by Leonid Desetnikov, who's one of the major Russian composers, not only on film, but in general. Uh, actually, one prominent music critic considers the score for Target the, one of the most important pieces of Russian music in recent years. Uh, it also, yeah, Acting is also somewhat detached, and one detail uh, that is not easily grasped by non-native speakers is that two female characters are played by foreign actresses. So they speak Russian, but they do so with an accent, the slight accent, which adds to this level of oddity. Um, and uh, yeah, the last part, the last thing I want to talk about is how the film relates to Russian literature. Because another thing that is typical of Sorokin is referring to the great Russian literature of the past, 19th, early 20th century. And Target scripts always a lot to that. Uh, Moscow, his previous films, his previous film, Zeldavich, also written by Sorokin, uh, referred to Chekhov's Three Sisters, and uh, Target uh, opens with a quote from uh, Tolstoy that is inverted in the film and attributed to Lao Tzu, but I don't think Lao Tzu ever said that. The quote is, uh, in the film's version, the quote is, all the happy are happy in their own way, all the miserable are alike. Uh, so, yeah, those who read Karenina remember that it's the opening phrase, but, you know, inverted. Um, so, yeah, in many ways, Target is a very, very loose adaptation of Karenina uh, in terms of narrative structure, in terms of character development, and some references, you know, direct references to that uh, novel. Um, yeah, there are a lot of similarities, and uh, m perhaps most importantly, the film is structured. Uh, I could bring up a picture. Uh, the film is structured like a novel. There is no one single main character. Uh, Victor, the minister, is probably more emphasized, but he's not really the and his wife. Is not they are not really central to the film because every one of the main characters have their own plot line that intersect uh, or they diverge at other points. And the ambition here is obviously to make a novel on film, which is a great task to accomplish and uh, we don't see it that much in, in film. And when we do, it's usually made by some grand masters of the past, like Kubrick or Visconti. And the running time is, of course, also might have something to do with that. Uh, and like in Tolstoy, <coughs> excuse me, uh, like in Karenina, uh, which had uh, Levin, 
uh, who is the only character who ended up happy. Target also has only one character who achieves happiness in the end, which might be a spoiler, but I hope it's not, because as you may have guessed already, Target is a kind of story that, as in Elliot, ends not with a bang, but with a whimper. Uh, some questions. Thank you very much.